بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله and I was asked to um, talk about an issue of character that is exemplified and articulated most beautifully by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, verse 159 of Surah Ali Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبِرَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَلَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ He's talking to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa And he tells him, it's by the mercy of Allah that you were soft and lenient with your companions. There's a context to the ayah. This is actually after the Battle of Uhud. And you know, during the Battle of Uhud, Muslims made a bit of a mistake. And they went against the command of Rasulullah. We don't need to get into details. They lost the battle. And some of them were expecting Rasulullah to be a little bit harsh, but he wasn't harsh with them. So Allah says, it's by the mercy of Allah that you weren't harsh with them. And if you were faddan, and we need to talk in detail about what that means. I'll translate it here in a second. That's number one. Number two, غليظ qalb, And we'll talk about what that means. They would have left you. They would have scattered about and they would have left you alone. And your da'wah would not have been effective. So that's the ayah that we're going to talk about. And I want to use a particular tafsir. Um, there's many different tafsir on this verse. A lot of them deal with the context of the battle of Uhud and whatnot. But Imam Fakhr al-Din razi has something very interesting in his tafsir. Because he differentiates between these two words. Fadh and غليظ al-qalb. And we need to understand what these two words mean to get the best out of this lecture, inshallah. Fadhan has to do with your outer character. It has to do with what he says, الَّذِي يَكُونُ سَيِّئُ الْخُلْقِ it's the one who has bad character in the sense of being very rude, gruff, rough, too direct to the point, always angry, loses their temper. In other words, the type of character traits that really make you want to get away from a certain person, right? Very, very unattractive. The opposite of a magnet, right? It just makes you want to stay away. Some people are like that, unfortunately. Even, they even think that they're saying the truth a lot of times. They say, I'm not afraid to say the truth, but they'll say it in a way that's very inappropriate or, you know, wrong or something like that. And so that's what fadl is, just being rough and gruff, coarse, in your outer character. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa in the Quran, when you go to Pharaoh, this is the most arrogant man on the face of this earth. Speak words of softness and kindness to him which is the opposite of fadl, right? So perhaps he might remember, he might attain some, um, you know, fear or awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The words might hit his heart. The way you talk to someone affects how they receive your message. So that's what fadl means. It has to do with the outer approach of an individual. But ghalid al-qalb, Imam Fakhr al-Din al-Razi says something very interesting about that. He says that this is huwa alladhi la yata'atharu qalbuhu an shay. This is the person whose heart is hardened so that they're no longer sensitive to people around them. They're not sensitive to what goes on around them. They're not sensitive to the states, to the situations, the emotional states, psychological turbulences, and physical defects of people around them. You just talk to people ignoring what they're going through. So this, unlike the first character trait, is not an outer thing. It's an inner thing. It's an inner thing. And this is what people would call nowadays, this is what people would call empathy. Being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes. There's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Everyone's got sympathy. Sympathy is when you feel sorry for someone. But empathy is a lot harder than that. Empathy is when you take yourself and you put yourself in someone else's shoes and you say to yourself, what are they going through? What's going through their mind right now? What kind of emotional state are they going through? What kind of um, e financial or um, psychological or emotional or family stressors, variables are affecting this person? And how should those things affect how I talk to them? That's what empathy is. And this is what 
this is what people nowadays call emotional intelligence. Is what Daniel Coleman coined in the late 1990s. He became very famous with a series of books on emotional intelligence. You know, they talk about you have rational intelligence, with the, which is what the IQ test measures. But there's also something called emotional intelligence. The IQ test doesn't measure that. Nowadays, they're talking about like metaphorical intelligence, your ability to make a metaphor to explain something. You know, the Quran is full of metaphors. This is very interesting. But there's many examples of how Rasulullah exemplified a qalb that is layin, a qalb that is sensitive, not insensitive, to what's going on around him. For example, one time he was giving da'wah. This is the empathy. This is the emotional intelligence of Rasulullah He was giving da'wah to a group of people called the Banyu Himyariya. This is in Qatarun Nada, a grammar book by Ibn Hisham. There's a grammar point here, but it's very... It's very relevant to what we're talking about. He's telling this group, this is a new group, new group of Muslims. He's telling them it's not from piety that you fast while traveling. But the Banu Himyariya, the thing that was special about them, they had a different dialect of Arabic. And they would say the, the word the, they would say am instead of al. That was the difference in their dialect. So what Rasulullah did, if you notice the words of the hadith, he changed the way he spoke. He changed his own dialect to match the dialect of the Banu Hamyariya. He said, It's not from piety that you fast while traveling. But he didn't say it in his own Qurayshi dialect. That would have been, He changed the way he spoke because he knew that if he sounds like the Banu Hamyariya, there will be a closer psychological attachment to them. He was sensitive to how that would affect their response to his da'wah. That's a qalb that's layin. That's not a qalb that's qali, that's a qalb that's layin. That's a qalb that's sensitive, it's aware, it's empathetic to what's going on around it. And you know, I, you know, it's a challenge for a lot of first generation Muslims who come here to really pick up the English language, but we really, we really should strive to the best of our ability to perfect the English language. Not know enough just to get by, but really do our best to perfect it. Every, if you've got an accent, that's fine. But to really do our best, to be articulate, have good vocabulary, good grammar, sound like the people we're talking to, it makes a huge difference in da'wah. Another time, Rasulullah this is how sensitive he was. He was talking to a Bedouin Arab who, you know, the Bedouins, they weren't that sophisticated. Right? And... Um, they, uh, a lot of times they didn't understand the more difficult things about Islam or the Sharia and stuff like that, so they kept it simple. And Rasulullah Sallallahu he used to have um, one of the, um, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, one of the companions, radiallahu anhu, used to have them teach the new people the Qur'an. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal was teaching this guy how to pray and teaching him Qur'an and stuff. This Bedouin Arab, we don't know his name. Rajulan, that's what his name is in the hadith, some man. And he comes to know that he's having some difficulties in the prayer. A lot of new Muslims have difficulties in the prayer, right? So he says, Sa'ala rajulan, ma tad'u fi salatik? What do you pray for when you pray? He asks, Rasulullah asked this man this. He says, As'alu rabbi kada wa kada, wa as'aluhu al jannah wa ta'awwadu min al nar. He said, I ask my Lord this and that, and I ask him for paradise, and I seek refuge from hellfire. And then he says this to Rasulullah <laughs> But as this complicated murmuring that you do in the prayer, and this complicated murmuring that Mu'adh does, I can't do all that. <laughs> He's talking about all the different words in the Salah that he can't understand. <laughs> I just ask for paradise, and I seek refuge from hell. And you know what Rasulullah <laughs> says to him? This is a qalb that's layin. This is a qalb that's sensitive to what's going on to, uh, around it and the environment around it. What's going on in this person? What's his situation? He's new. He says, It's around these two things that we murmur anyway. Because <laughs> he, he knows he just needs to taste the sweetness of iman. And then after that, step by step, you know, in this verse, this very verse that we read, in one of the tafsir of the ulama, one of the Sahabi is quoted as saying, what a mercy this guy was. What a mercy. The way that Rasulullah taught us. He didn't teach us the whole deen at once. He didn't give us all the rules at once. 
No, he gave us one thing. La ilaha illallah. And he let us taste the sweetness of that. And if he would have given us all the rules and all the sharia, it would have been too difficult for us. But once we tasted the sweetness of la ilaha illallah, then we took things one step at a time. We have a serious problem with being sensitive and empathetic to the convert community that comes to our masajid. The minute they convert to Islam, we want to give them the entire sharia on a list of, on a sheet of paper. Everything you can do, everything you can do. You got to get married, change your name, this, that, the other, and learn how to make biryani. <laughs> right? And what do they feel? They feel it's too much. Just as Allah says in the ayah, they would leave you. And what do they do? They leave. And they feel bad. They wish they could have stayed, but they say, no, this is too much. We got to take that same approach of emotional intelligence of Rasulullah and not be ghalid al qalb, not have a heart that's just inflexible and it can't understand what's going on around it and the situation, what's going on around it. Another beautiful example, um, Rasulullah he used to have a servant, you all know, Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu. You hear about him a lot, he narrated a lot of hadith because he lived with Rasulullah at a very young age. What we don't know, Anas ibn Malik actually had a younger brother. Does anybody know what the younger brother's name was? Abu Umair. That was his younger brother's name. Now, Abu Umair had a bird. <laughs> he had a pet bird. He loved this bird. Abu Umair loved his bird. And because Rasulullah was always with Anas ibn Malik, that was his khadam, it was his servant. He used to always see his younger brother play with his bird and be happy and whatnot. And one day, Rasulullah look, this is how sensitive he was. This is how empathetic he was. One day he sees this man, this young boy, Abu Umair, just not himself. And he inquires, and he finds out his bird died. It's very sad. He finds out his bird died. And so he goes up to him, and he asks, this very, he asks him a question that's become a very famous line of words. He says, Ya Abu Umair, ma fa'ala Nugair. Oh, Abu Umair, what has Nugair done? Nugair was the name of his bird. He names his bird Nugher. So he says, oh, Abba Umer, what's going on with Nugher? Tell me about it. Tell me about your pet bird Nugher. What's going on? This man was a prophet, a statesman, a father to multiple children, a husband to multiple wives, a, you know, a, a, every, you know, he's got time to go talk to a little kid about his pet bird. That's layin al qalb. That's having a heart that's sensitive, empathetic, and knows what's going on around it. So these are the two qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this, in this verse. Is one, not being in your outward character, not being rough and gruff. And two, in your inward state, not being emotionally ignorant. The opposite, obviously, the Arabs, they say things are known by their opposites, is having good character on the outside, gentle, nice approach, but being emotionally intelligent on the inside and sensitive to what's going on around you, empathetic to people's situations and positions. Now, when you take these two things and you put them together, you get something very, very powerful called hilm. Who can tell me what hilm means? What does hilm mean? For kindness or really forbearance. It's a different type of kindness. It's a kindness that is at the highest level of ihsan. It's at the highest level of character, and it's something that's very, very attractive in human beings. It's very, very powerful as a tool of da'wah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning these two characteristics. Because just like having the opposite of them causes people to leave you, having emotional intelligence and being sensitive and empathetic and good outward character causes people to be attracted to you and attracted to the message that you're talking about. Now this takes a struggle. This takes a struggle and you really have to work to attain this. And this is why he says in a hadith, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِتَعَلُّمِ وَالْحِلْمُ بِتَحَلُّمِ Knowledge is only gained by struggling to attain it. Hilm is only gained by struggling to attain it. Tahallum, anytime you hear a verb on the wazn, on the scale of tafa'ul, it means to struggle to get that verb. So when Allah says in the Quran, 
and this is a sign for people who yet that means people who struggle to think. They struggle to think. So when he says al hilmu bi tahallum, means the only way you're going to be a person of hilm is if you struggle over time to attain this quality. That's why one step lower than hilm is kathmul ghayd, being able to restrain your anger. Because people wal kathimin al ghayd, Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions them in the Quran. These are people who they get angry and they get disturbed, and you can see it in their body language, right? But they struggle. They really hold on to themselves to avoid manifesting it. But hilm is different. Hilm is a divine quality. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not affected by emotions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not driven to take revenge by a certain way that he feels. And this is why Imam al-Ghazali, in his book, Maqsad al-Asna, fi sharh al-Asma'i Allah al-Husna, he talks about the name of Allah al-Halim. Al-Halim is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he defines this name. And the, by the way, the name of the book, Maqsadul Asna, the greatest goal in knowing the 99 names of Allah. He says the greatest goal in knowing the 99 names of Allah is not to memorize them. It's to internalize them. Because that's the only way you'll be a real human being. So he talks about the name Al-Halim. And then what you can do to internalize the quality of Halim to be one step closer to what it means to be a real human being. So he defines Al-Halim, and he says, He's the one who sees the sins of the people who sin. And he sees people going against his commands. Anger doesn't shake him. And he's not overwhelmed with emotional turbulence. And he's not pushed to take revenge, even though he's fully capable of doing that. Listen to that definition. That's what hilm is. If you want to be a person of hilm, you've got to be a person who can control themselves. Both outwardly and on the inside understand what's going on. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows his ibad. Ala ya'lamu man khalaqa? Allah, he's the one who created, shouldn't he know? When you can combine these two things, you'll be a person of him. Specifically, when it comes to not taking revenge, Rasulullah in the Fathul Mecca, he had every ability. He had every ability to take revenge on his people. Right? He, they, he was tortured for years. He was assaulted. He was insulted. He was attacked. His community was killed. And he had every ability to take revenge. And he was capable of doing so. He had full capacity to do so. But what does he do? He tells them, he goes in and he says, whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. Because he was aware, he was empathetic, he was sensitive. He knew that there was already a hierarchy in the city. And if people feel like they can keep that hierarchy, then maybe it'll be easier for them to come into Islam. And they all did. See, that's combining the good of the outer character with the awareness of the inner emotional intelligence. Another example, his body language. His body language was full of hilm. His body language was full of, um, of, full of, of, of forbearance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When the people of ignorance, jahilun, you know what's interesting? A jahil in the Arabic language what do we translate it as? Ignorant? A jahil in the Arabic language really means someone who can't control themselves. That's what an ignorant person really is in the Arabic language. You know what an aqil means? An aqil we translate it as intelligent. An aqil is someone who can control themselves. That's what an aqil is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ When the people of ignorance approach them and they, you know, they speak words of ignorance to the people of hilm, قَالُوا salama. That's translated as they say peace, but that's not what it really means. Imam Zamakhshari in his Kashafi says, Qalu salam. Salam is a hal. It's a state. It's a state that they're in. You can see it in their body language. You know, people who restrain themselves, you can see it like, um, you know, their eyes get red. <laughs> their blood pressure goes up. They're shaking. But people of Hilm are not like that. They're calm, cool, and collected. That's why Allah says, Yamshuna al ardi hona. They walk through the earth calm, cool, and collected. 
And so one time Rasulullah was walking and a Bedouin came up to him. He was walking with a companion. And a Bedouin, he used to wear a cloak. And he came up, this Bedouin came up and ripped the cloak off his neck. And said, Murli min mali lahi ladhi Give me some of that money that Allah gave you. Just like that. Now look at the hilm of Rasulullah He's not taken over by anger. He doesn't have emotional turbulence. فَالْتَفَطَ إِلَيْهِ فَضَحِكَ He turned and looked at him and smiled. That was it. That's the hilm. That's why so many people were so attracted to him. He told his companion, okay, give him some money. <laughs> no big deal. He wouldn't make a big deal out of things. We make a big deal out of the biggest things. And it's so unattractive to the people. And non-Muslims see that at times, you know? But a, a person of hilm, a person who really combines the two things we talked about in this ayah, nothing is a big deal. Everything to them is asghar. Everything to them is smaller. It's less of a big deal because Allah is akbar. Because Allah is the greater. They see that Allah is the greater, so everything else becomes not a big deal. In another incident, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there was a woman who would stop him تُوقِفُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ الْمَرْأَةُ أَمَتُ فَيَقِفُ مَعَهَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقِفُ مَعَهَا دَقِيقَةً أو دَقِيقَتَين أو سَعَةً أو سَعَةين ليقضي معها حاجتها. There was a woman he used to walk throughout Mecca in a certain path, and a woman would stop him, and she would, you know, she was actually a slave woman. She had no significance whatsoever. And she would talk to him. She had all these issues she wanted to talk to him about. Sometimes he would stand there and talk to her for a minute, two minutes, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for two hours until she finally got out. Which she, she, he wouldn't like look at his cell phone. He wouldn't look at his watch. <laughs> hey, I got to go. No, this was his hilm. This was his forbearance because he was able to see the situation that she was in and, and he was able to respond in, um, in kind. Um, there's a beautiful story, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just end on this, of Imam Zain al-Abidin. Zain al-Abidin was the great-grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They called him as Sajjad, the, the person who was always in prostration. Zain al-Abidin means the beautification of the worshippers. He resembled what was most beautiful of worship. And one time he went to the Kaaba, this man was so sincere that one time he made wudu, just to tell you about Zain al-Abidin, one time he made wudu, and Imam Ghazali says in his ihya, وَاسْتَصْفَرَ وَجْهُ His face became yellow. And they asked him, مَا بَالُوا رَجُوا What's going on with this guy? And he said, أَتَدْرِي بَيْنِ يَدَيْ مَنْ أُرِيدُ أَنَ قُومْ Do you know who I'm about to stand in front of? <laughs> that was Zain al-Abidin. So this man, one day, he was praying in front of the Kaaba. And a person came up to him, and you know, during that time, there were still some antagonistic feelings towards the Ahlul Bayt. Um, this was during the Umayyad dynasty. A man came up to him and said, Anta alladhi tuda'abi Zain al-Abidin? Are you the one they call Zain al-Abidin? And he said, yeah. He said, Anta sheenu al-Abidin. Sheen means disgrace. He said, you're the disgrace of the worshippers, not the beautification of the worshippers. And he insulted him, and he told him this, and he told him that, and he said, you're this, and you're that, and you're this, and you're that. And you know what he did? People got upset, and they were about to jump in. He said, leave him. Leave him. And when he finished, he said, He said, you know what? Everything that you mentioned is inside of me. And what has been hidden from you is even greater than that. Do you want me to tell you those things that were hidden from you so you can complete that advice that you started for me? Baka <laughs> rajul. He began to cry. He said, Ashadu annaka bini Rasulillah. I bear witness you're the son of Rasulullah. He said, forgive me. They bribed me. They said, if you go insult, Zain al-Abidin will give you a thousand dinar. He said, okay, I'll give you a thousand dinar. Don't worry about that. <laughs> That is hilm. That is good outer and inner. 
That is combining the inner emotional intelligence with the outer goodness of character. That is what Allah subhanahu wa says in Quran. Idfa' billati hi ahsan. Repel evil with what is good. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِينٌ And you will find that the one where there is enmity between you and he, you will find a friendship forming. That's the power of hilm. That's the power of forbearance. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about this verse. Ibn Abbas, he says about that verse, idfa' bi hilmik jahlu man yajahal alayk. Repel with your forbearance the ignorance of the one who acts ignorantly against you. Imagine if we incorporated this. Imagine if we internalized this. How attractive would our da'wah be? How attractive would our message be? How attractive would we be as human beings? And how much closer would we be to being one step closer to being what it really means to be an insan.